Okay, so we want to rule out obstructive sleep apnea. And um, this is, a, as I've said, a disorder of breathing that's caused by partial or complete airway obstruction. Um, and we need to look to, at the characteristics of kids. Kids with smaller jaws, kids who have bigger tongues. I was just working with a mom the other day who has a, a little person with Down syndrome. And they, they usually do have smaller jaws and bigger tongues. And so I very carefully went through an, an assessment around whether or not we could be dealing with sleep apnea here. Uh, rather than a behavioral sleep problem. So we have to pay attention to that. Um, the highest rates of sleep apnea are in preschoolers. It's about 2 to, two to 3 percent. Um, we often hear parents say that these kids snore at night, and particularly the kids with uh, hypertrophic tonsils and adenoids. They tend to snore because the tonsils and adenoids partially obstruct the airway. Um, but they can also end up pausing with their breathing, gasping or choking. So they can be sleeping and all of a sudden it's kind of like there's this pause and then they kind of go <gasps> and then start up again. So I always ask parents about that. But also there's restless sleep. Um, so we need to ask parents about are they thrashing all over the crib because they, or the whatever sleep surface they're on because they can't get into a sleep position that works for them. Or are they sleeping with their head really, really extended far back because they do that to open up the airway. So we need to find out, are any of these characteristics happening? Because if they are, then we need to refer this child for, uh, to be seen by a specialist, pre preferably a respirologist, to be assessed for sleep apnea, because they may well need to either have their tonsils and adenoids taken out when they're older, or they may need to have some kind of partial um, airway um, inflation like CPAP or something like that to help them with the airway obstruction. So we shouldn't be working with um, these kids for behavioral sleep problems. So I always ask about chronic rhinitis, that's with a chronic runny nose, uh, nasal congestion, mouth breathing. If they've got otitis media, they've got a history of lots of ear infections, that's, this can be a problem. Um, the enlarged tonsils and adenoids. And also um, I usually ask about whether they've got a history of asthma because asthma can be linked to infant sleep problems too and so can reflux. So you need to be asking about reflux and whether there's, this kid's got a problem with reflux and it's being treated for it. So what are the effects? Um, before I, I launch into this, do we want to talk, does anybody want to raise anything about what I've already talked about? Do you have questions or comments or, yeah? Um, when you're the biggest risk for SIDS is in the first six months of life. So most of the interventions I'm talking about are from six months on. And we're at a developmental stage there where the kid does not have to be room sharing with the parent, especially if they're getting into their longest sleep period of six hours and usually longer. They don't have to be getting up every hour or an hour and a half to breastfeed them. And so we need to look at what works best for these kids developmentally. So it's like a, an evolution. It's an evolution. And what happens usually is everybody acts as though these kids are zero to three months when they're three to six months or six to nine months. And so there isn't really an incorporation of the developmental changes that are going on into the advice that parents are getting. And that's a problem, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I usually say to parents, encourage self-consoling when they're little. And also, um, try to put them down drowsy, but not asleep. Try not to feed them to sleep all the time. Change the diaper before you put them down so they wake up a little bit. So you're gradually getting them used to this notion of falling asleep on their own. So it's not this big disjuncture that happens when they suddenly they're six months old and it's like, okay, well, the, enough of this, waking up every hour to two hours. Now you're going to have to learn to self-soothe. And they've had absolutely no inkling of how to do that for the first six months. And it partly comes out of this whole thing we do about contingent caregiving. And it's not that I am against contingent caregiving. I'm the first person who would recommend it. But I think contingent caregiving has to be put in the framework of the developmental stage of the infant and not just contingent caregiving as though it always looks exactly the same. That's about a few things. Um, part of what goes on when they're six months old is often they start to teeth. 
and teething interferes with sleep. There's no doubt about it. And I think we're also, okay, so you asked, and I have my little bandwagons, and this is one of them. Um, I think we're also a very, very reluctant to give uh, children um, anything for pain when they're teething. And I, I know, because I've had braces, what it's like to try and sleep after your braces have been adjusted. And you don't sleep, okay, unless you take something for pain. And so it's given me a whole new appreciation for what it is like for kids to go through teething. And this notion that, you know, they can kind of tough it out, it, it, it will interfere with their sleep. And some of them run a low-grade fever when they're teething, too. And what happens to you with sleep is, at about 4 o'clock in the morning, for us and for kids, our thermostats reset. And there's a little spike in our temperature. And that's our signal to the body to say, it's almost time to wake up now. And then, after that, you go through these various stages and you wake. If you've got a kid that's teething, so A, they've got pain, and B, they're running a low-grade fever, that's going to interfere with that normal thermostat acting in terms of sleep. So often I'll say to parents, well, if you give them a little something for pain and it also helps with the thermal regulation, you're probably going to find that they sleep a little better around this. But also, I think what happens when they get to be about six months old is the, how could I label this? The not so good behaviors that you've gotten away with when they were up to six months old come back to bite you. So they're at a stage now where they're making lots of transitions to the consolidation of daytime sleep. And often these kids don't consolidate their daytime sleep. They're the cat nappers. They're the kids who are hard to get down for naps. They're the kids who don't sleep in the daytime. And then that starts to go uh, into the nighttime sleep and it starts to make it harder to settle them and harder to keep them asleep at night because they have more fragmented sleep at night because they're sleep deprived. And then it just turns into this spiral. I haven't seen too much of that. Um, now I think that's an interesting question because in some of the families I've been dealing with, there are kids that we that I've been involved with over an extended period of time. There's one mom who emailed me the other day and her kid is now two and a half or three. And this is clearly a child who doesn't tolerate change well. So every time there's some major change in their lives, her sleep goes out the window. And it can be something like, you know, they left their old house, they moved in temporarily with the grandparents before they moved into their new house. I guess it was being built for them, I don't know. And so the transition from sleeping in the old house to the grandparents' house caused a major sleep disruption. Then the transition from moving to the grandparents' house to the new house caused a major sleep disruption. And that was even with them trying to maintain like old cribs and as much as they could in the environment. Um, so there's some kids who don't handle change well at all. But I haven't found that establishing th these routines actually makes children inflexible. Because often what happens is it's easier to ha for them to handle adapting to going away and then coming home if they've got the security of getting into a routine again when they get home or if you can maintain some semblance of that routine when they're overseas. So I'll say to parents who are taking their kids overseas, don't try and keep them on our time, move them into the time they're in so they can adjust and you know try as much as you can to re- um, establish some of the routines, obviously you're not going to be able to do all of them, but some of the routines that were going on when you had them at home where you are. And in many ways that, that helps the kids be more adaptable. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs>